everybody. My name is Lisa Miner. I represent Multispan. And today we're going to continue our series of presentations discussing ortholog GPCRs. Um, today we're going to talk about precautions in taking GPCR molecule into animals. And once again, I'm joined by Terry Knacken. And Terry, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, folks. I'm Terry Knacken. I'm a pharmacologist at UNC School of Medicine. I spent most of my career in industry, GSK, and I present my comments from the point of view of chemists and biologists moving compounds forward towards candidate selection. So that's great. So this is going to be a very short presentation here. The very first thing we want to talk about, though, is the progression. What is the progression scheme for taking new drug molecules into um, all the way through basically into animals? So, Terry, you have a good slide on that? Yes, it's the one that we saw in, in the first of this series. It's the sort of ideal world slide, Lisa, where you you have a compound that's active in, in your human receptor system, and then you move it into your animal model of therapeutic activity, which you must do unless you could test the compound directly in humans in a therapeutic setting. And uh, there are very rare instances where you can do this. So you have to test and animal model to see if you have reason to progress forward. And so in an ideal world, your compound's active in the human system, it's active in the animal systems, and you're away to the races. Uh, what can happen, however, and as we saw in previous um, slides in this series, is very small differences in the um, between the human and animal receptor in terms of am amino acid sequences can cause catastrophic differences in activity. What you see here are compounds that uh, were uh, made for humans and they showed activity in the rat, but they were totally inactive in humans. So such a finding would really stop your program. Um, let me show you an example of where this was the case. The next slide shows um, the human D1 receptor potentiation effect of a compound, an al allosteric PAM. And one would propose that this would be useful in increasing cognition in schizophrenia. So the hope is that you would um, have this activity in humans. The next step would be to test it in a rat model of cognition mediated by D1 receptors. So in the best case scenario, you, you would see activity in, in your human system and in your rat model. However, the next slide shows this team wisely made the step to check before they went into the expensive and resource heavy uh, rat model um, to check that their compound was active, as active in, um, in the rat D1 receptor, and as you saw, the worst happened. Uh, their, their compound was totally inactive. So whether it would be useful in humans or not, there's no way to assess that their compound would be um, active from studies in rat because it would not be active in rat. So this was a um, um, un unhappy event, but a wise event in this program. Obviously, they would continue screening to look for more molecules. Hopefully. Hopefully. So, so then that brings me to my another question, which is there's many times when you do screening and you have really good human molecules and you think that they're the ones you're going to move forward. They look good. They, they behave the way they're supposed to. But when you actually test them against your, your model species, they either, they don't match the, the activity that you see in the human. They're either less potent, not active, like you saw on that one against the D1, 
Um, so the question is, let's say you have molecules that you've discovered and they just don't have the same activity as they have in the human. Your best ones in the human aren't the best ones in the in the animal. Um, what do you do? Do you take the, the the best one that you have that's in the animal into the animal? Once obviously you look at PK and you're making sure that everything else is the same, except the only difference really is the activity. Do you take it in the animal as a proof of concept? Do you, you know, how do you handle that kind of situation, which comes up quite frequently? Good question. Um, I think you would start by thinking about the reasons why you do this process of human assay moving into an animal model. Uh, there are two reasons that you could um, think about there. The first is the obvious one. You have activity in the human, you have activity in animals, you're you're happy and you move for, forward and see if you have therapeutic activity. But the second one is you have um, activity in humans, you don't have activity in animals, but other lesser compounds, compounds you're not as interested in, do have activity. This is still important to move forward as a proof of concept because you're doing this process, you're still jumping through a lot of hoops from the um, assay into the therapeutic arena and asking the question, does, does this model predict what I might see in humans? So I would suggest anything you see active in the human and also in the animal model, even though it's not ideal, I would move it forward just for the proof of concept step. The other part of that is now you've got compounds that um, were not active in the rat. If your model is somewhat predictive, if your compounds that weren't as good <laughs> still showed interesting activity in humans, I would uh, test those compounds that were very active in the human system, even though they weren't active in the rat, to see if you can uncover unique activity in humans. Yeah, maybe you can wind up testing them in a human primate, non-human primate yep. too, which might work as well. Yep. All right. So the next question, the next thing that we have a question about is where do you get these um, ortholog receptors? So um, in multi-span throughout the years, we've developed a very large portfolio of ortholog receptors with different signaling paths. And on the next slide, you can see a table of a lot of receptors. Um, and the receptors are for, we have mouse, rat, dog, um, monkey. It really depends on which receptor we are looking at. And the way that we developed these is throughout the years, companies came to us wanting us to develop both a human receptor as well as a receptor against their model species, um, a cell line that has a receptor against the model species. And so we did do that. And uh, those cell lines are now in our portfolio and they're available for purchase. They're also available for us to do the testing for you. They're available as, a, as um, frozen assay ready cells. <laughs> and then finally, um, if we don't have the, the receptor you're interested in, in the species where you're interested in, we can develop that for you. Um, so, you know, please go to our multi-span website, multispaninc.com for information about the different receptors you're interested in. And you can see all the orthologs and the signaling pathways that are available in that system. And we would be glad to discuss this with you. So Terry, are there any final thoughts for today? Just one more comment on um, reiterating, um, I work with nu numerous groups where they have this idea of activity in humans translating to an animal model, and they skip the uh, animal receptor step, thinking that it's not necessary. I would stress that it really could be important and very cost effective if you do that. Yeah, and and the other thing that people have to realize is if you're a farmer, even if you're not if you're not a farmer, but if even if you are a farmer, that animals cost money, they're alive, they're and so 
in, even in grant proposals, you have to justify the number of animals you're using for, for different studies. And so it's important to reduce the use of animals. So you want to only use the molecules that are going to have the best chance of, of having activity in those model systems. Right. So, yeah, so I think I agree with you. I think testing in the against the animal receptor is critical. All right, so thank you. If anybody has questions, please visit our website and um, have a good day.